going this way. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. I have behaved myself this morning, and I feel really good. Uh, <laughs> Brother Tim doesn't. <laughs> I feel great. Uh, and it's that day off yesterday. Man, I'll tell you what, we didn't have anything scheduled in church yesterday. Several people called me yesterday trying to schedule things, and uh, I said, no, no, I'm not doing anything today. Nothing on the schedule. And uh, yesterday, Anthony got up, and he went out back and got a shovel, and he started working on a project we were working on Friday. And uh, I said, you don't have to do that. And so we goofed around all day, and I didn't see Anthony. There he is, right there. Look at him. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, looking great. And so we're in good shape today. I, let me, let me, I, I, I mentioned that because I'm being a little bit silly, but I want to I make a serious suggestion to you, and that is that you schedule rest in your life. Schedule rest in your life and make sure. And I'm not, you know, there's people they, they, that becomes their religion. You know, make sure that you know we go on cruises and vacations, and it's not really rest. And I think sometimes it's just a waste of life. But you know, God made a Sabbath day, he made a Sabbath day, and He made it for man to rest, and He made man created man needing rest. And the Lord's day is not Sabbath day. It's not the same thing. Uh, you know, a lot of Christians, some years back, I used to hear a lot, I haven't heard in quite a while, but I used to hear a lot about, you know, pushing people and burnout. And, you know, Pastor, you don't want to push people too hard, and you don't want to get burned out, you don't want to burn out, and so forth. And I found that uh, there's the, the rhetoric around burnout or burning the candle at both ends and so forth for believers, I found it's cover-up for a lot of things. It really is. A believer, I don't think, who is in fellowship with the Lord and who lives in a way that God wants him to live, it doesn't have to be concerned about burning out and going away from serving the Lord Jesus. Your stories are people that used to love the Lord, they used to serve the Lord, and then they burned out and now look at them and so forth. It isn't true uh, from that sense. Uh, that I think that that's cover up for other things that are untrue. In other words, something that's not right. There's, there's something behind those things. But... Having said that, God created us needing rest, and worship is not rest. Worship takes effort, and coming to worship the Lord Jesus and doing the ministry and reaching people and fellowshipping, I don't know about you, but I would challenge you to do what I do on a Sunday and feel rested at the end of the day. It just isn't, it isn't physically possible. And I would challenge you to do what a faithful Christian should, do, should, should a Christian who is mature in the faith uh, be teaching, be instructing, be working, be uh, investing themselves in the ministry? Well, I think all believers should, shouldn't they? And if that's true, then is that a day of rest? Not really. It isn't really. And so the Sabbath is different than the Lord's Day. Lord's Day is the first day of the week. The Sabbath is the last day of the week. And the Lord's Day is sort of like a bonus for believers. A uh, you know, five-day work week is actually a Christian concept. Did you know that? A uh, five-day work week is a Christian idea. And the further we get away from God, the less we have it in our society, uh, if you would take note of it. I grew up, and it could be because I'm from Kansas, but uh, I think it would have been true here as well from people I've spoken to. I grew up where on Sunday morning when we went out to get in our car and go to church, everybody on the block was going in to get in their car to go to church. And where restaurants, most of them weren't open on Sundays, and gas stations were closed on Sundays. You say, Pastor, small rural town? Yeah, uh, about 55,000 people, maybe 90,000 in the county or so, so a small area. Uh, but you know what? Everybody, we didn't all go to the same churches, but everybody worshipped, and the way society was was different. My dad, uh, for most of the years I was growing up, had a used car dealership, and the Salina Businessmen's Association had all gotten together and agreed uh, that no, uh, none of the businesses would do business on Sundays. And if you uh, sold a car, you could actually lose your license on a Sunday if you found if someone found out that you sold a car on Sundays. And that was not that was just because of, that was the day, that was the time for it, because we used to be much more of a Christian nation than we are even today. We've, we've progressed a long way. So when I say something like a five-day work week is a Christian concept, it actually is. It used to be a six-day work week, but then after the cross, then that first day of the week became a celebration. 
And God has blessed people to be able to do in five what could only happen in six. And you try it sometime. You honor the Lord and you schedule rest in your life and God will, God will take care of you. He'll provide the things that you were trying to provide without His help. And you just be faithful in, the, in those areas. And uh, the, the real point, of, I, I guess I got off into that, the real point of what I wanted to say was that you'll have a lot better Lord's Day if you make sure that you prepare yourself for it the day before. And so here we are in Revelation chapter 21. And I want to see if anybody jumps up and stomps out real quick. So I'm going to announce my sermon title before we read our text. I'm going to preach to you today about the wall. Okay? And let's read our text before you stomp out, if you will, please. All right? Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 21. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. And then verse 13, on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Then I want to look at verse 25, and we, we'll hopefully do some, uh, we'll get ourselves to that point. In verse 25, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Let's pray. Father, please help us today as we go to the Scripture to be able to see what our future holds and be able to see truths about You as we look at this new Jerusalem that would help us not only to know You better, but to be living in light of our future. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright, let me just tell you, just a disclaimer right at the beginning, there will be nothing political today at all. I was just trying to be funny, okay, when I said I was going to preach about the wall today. But uh, it's, it, it isn't a coincidental how the Holy Spirit works when you're preaching through a, a series or a sermon. Isn't it interesting how things just come up that just kind of fit themes? Well, this, this is not political. It has nothing to do uh, with what is worldwide known today as the wall. This is, the, this is the real wall. This is the one that really matters here. We're going to focus not on the wall today as we get further into our text, but we're going to look at the gates. And uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time delving into each of the gates. I want to just make some application from it. Now, thus far as we've been in the, as we've been in the Scripture, we have seen uh, the, the period of judgment where God judges the world where the saints have cried out because of the blood that was spilled, where uh, in every generation individuals have falsely accused God of being unjust because of not destroying the wicked. We, see, we have seen uh, the, not only the judgment of the wicked, but ultimately the final destruction of the same. The wicked have been dealt with at the hand of God. We saw in Revelation, as we begin our series, uh, we saw, first of all, we saw the layout of the letter that John wrote and that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. We saw the chronological aspects of it. Revelation 1.19 is a key verse. Uh, if you're studying Revelation, write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And that is the outline for Revelation. Every good letter writer says in his introduction what he's going to say. And the Holy Spirit did so with John in that. So you see... Uh, you see John for the things which were. He gives the experience that happened to him that led up to the writing of the letter on the Isle of Patmos there. And then you see John writing uh, the letters, or the Holy Spirit giving the letters to the seven churches. And that, of course, is present tense. That is the things which are, the things that are currently occurring and happening. And the things which shall be hereafter ultimately culminate in this city that we've seen described here, the new Jerusalem. And let me just say, because it's important to say it today, unfortunately, because of all the anti-Semitic theology that's going on, this is a Jewish city. And on the wall are 12 gates which have names for the 12 tribes which are Israel. 
And so it is in this economy that God is working. It's through the kingdom. And that kingdom, my friend, is Israeli. And its king is Jesus. And it's important for us. You'd think that that would go without saying. But unfortunately, there is rampant, rampaging, ridiculous uh, rhetoric. Is that enough R's for you guys? I'm not, a, I'm not one of those people. But the reality of it is there's so much anti-Semitism today that is it's just over the top uh, from people that are that are I believe are born again believers and it's just bad theology and they're saying this is not Israel that God's using and is Israel is the Jews today are not actually Jewish and I don't even want I don't need to educate you about false doctrine you can do that on your own if you feel the need for it but revelation contradicts all of that and so we've seen the judgment one of the let me just ask a question what are the differences between tribulation as we see oftentimes for believers in the New Testament and tribulation as we see in this uh, three and a half and three and a half, two, three and a half uh, year divisions in Revelation. What are the differences between tribulation like you could have today and that tribulation? What's the primary difference? It's from God. What? It's, from God. it's the hand of God. It is the hand of God. There's a big difference between God God uh, judging you or God uh, giving you torment or uh, consequences like we see in man, isn't there? Man can do terrible things. It's actually incredible what the wicked heart of man is actually capable of. Some people on social media uh, that I'm friends with were arguing an issue uh, this last week. It was sort of political, sort of Christian, and somebody said something to the effect of, this is about the uh, the the uh, congresswoman, I think it's congress from um, from Detroit. What's her name? I, I can't pronounce her name. Anyway, she, she was sworn in on the Koran last week. Yeah. And one of the guys was offended about it. And I am too, by the way. I don't, I don't care if, you, if it bothers you that I say that. And the, and the, for me, the, the issue is, is that America is a nation that has been founded on biblical principles and we our laws reflect the Bible laws and Sharia is unconscionable. The, the Sharia law is wicked and the Quran represents Sharia law and I'm not concerned about saying that. That shouldn't offend you. That's a fact. And it's just it's the way it is. But somebody said something like, well swearing in on the Bible has never helped our nation at all. Um, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. See my friend the fact is, is, we have no idea what a terrible country this would be if we were entirely godless. We just don't know how bad it would be. Uh, you say, well, swearing in on the Bible, well, a person swearing by the Bible doesn't mean anything for that individual. But a nation being concerned about God takes, an, takes people that are capable of utter wickedness and restrains them. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, you think things are bad, take God out of the equation entirely. Take God entirely out. And the human mind, the god, a godless individual is, a, is capable of nearly anything. But my friend, a human individual only has human capabilities. God's judgment, my friend, is supernatural. Has supernatural capability. And there, you, you may have undergone terrible things you may have gone through terrible things at the hand of man. But to undergo judgment at the hand of God is a different matter entirely. And the events that we've seen up to this point that have taken us to this place in Revelation have been that God has finally judged the wicked. Last week we saw the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ being, the, we call it the millennial reign. Uh, Millennium is a thousand years, okay? You don't know what that is. There are a lot of people who say, well, where is that term in the Bible? Uh, well, it's a thousand year reign of Christ. Just like rapture, a lot of people have a problem with the word rapture, which is a word for catch up or snatch or, or to take up. It, it, or the word tribulation. A lot of people uh, struggle or they, they develop theological implications about the word tribulation and, and because of, so you say, Pastor, you're just talking right over my head. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, Good. I'm glad I am. I'm glad you, you haven't learned some of the nonsense that people come up with by defining words and making doctrines or attacking doctrines on the basis of a word instead of on the context of what the Scripture teaches. Okay, now, we saw the trumpets, trumpet judgments. We saw the seal judgments. We saw the woe judgments. 
and one of the last woe judgments were seven angels uh, that uh, were part of the last of the woe judgments. And we've seen those seven angels mentioned several times. It actually leads us right into our context in chapter 21 in, in verse 9. You see it? There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. Remember those, the, those terrible last plagues, the seven vile judgments? And, and that's the third woe. They're part of the third woe judgment. And talk with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, I like this for the... I'm being a little bit silly here, but, but only a little bit. I like this uh, for the PR of the seven angels, because we only know them as destructive up to this point. But an angel is simply a messenger, and in this case, a messenger of God. And in this case, they're not coming to do something terrible. They're not coming to release a terrible uh, judgment. They're coming to show John that greatly anticipated, uh, that greatly anticipated event, which is the revealing of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've been introduced to the bride several places in the Scripture. We know that the that the church is part of that bride of Jesus Christ, and uh, we know here. From the scripture, now, now don't choke on this, but we know here that this bride ultimately ends up having not only the foundation of the 12 apostles, but the gates of the city of this bride, Jerusalem, are the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. And so there are individuals that think the bride's the church, and there are individuals that think that the bride is the 12 apostles. And my friend, it's, it, the, theological systems overcomplicate simple truths. Sometimes the fact is, is that the bride of Jesus Christ are the saved. They're the believers from every generation, from every time period. And so, for people that develop bad Baptist theology by uh, making the bride only the church, uh, they don't have answers for the question: Where, where are all the saints from ages past that are not privileged to be part of the church? Where are they as part of the bride? And friend, I just have to say that's just a whole lot of nonsense, and it's simply explained away by just looking at this city of Jerusalem, which is called the Bride. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, lest we lack clarity about the Bride. I think most of us have this passage of Scripture memorized. But Ephesians chapter 5, this is when uh, Jesus is given instruction, not Jesus, this is when the Apostle Paul is given instructions to the church, and he is giving instructions regarding how believers treat one another. And he uh, begins in verse uh, 21, by commanding the believers to submit themselves one to another in the fear of God. And then he just goes through, in particular, the family unit, wives, husbands, children, parents. Goes through the different relationships that everybody has. And pretty much everybody is one of those four classifications, right? You're either a wife or a husband if you're married, and you're either a child or a parent if you're born sometime, somewhere. Okay, so general statements in this the way that believers are to behave toward one another is to submit themselves one to another in the fear of God. And a husband submits in the way that a husband's supposed to submit. A wife submits in the way a wife is supposed to submit. A parent submits in the way a parent is supposed to submit. And a child submits in the way that children are to submit. And, the script, and Ephesians 5 explains that. But right in the middle of that explanation, the Apostle Paul gives another a little bit of... Uh, uh, information and he talks about the mystery of Christ and his church. Uh, look at this in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we know that the we're going to see that the bride of Jesus Christ is all those individuals whom Christ gave himself for. So you want to just, if you want to compile. A, a little bit of a list that gives you an understanding of whom the bride is, you could say the bride of Christ are individuals that Jesus gave himself for. All right, let's just go through some, some time periods and ask the question of whether Jesus gave himself for uh, these individuals or not. Uh, Adam and Eve. Yes, sir. yes, Jesus gave himself for them. I love Genesis chapter 3 when the Scripture prophesies the seed of of a woman will bruise the serpent's head. And that's a prophecy that Jesus is going to give himself for Adam and Eve. Uh, could we say uh, Abel, uh, Noah, Abraham, <coughs> Moses, Israel, 
uh, the church. In other words, are these individuals Jesus has given himself for? You say, Pastor, you missed Job. Yeah, I think he gave himself for Job too. Don't you agree? So the bride simply described, are they not individuals that Jesus Christ has given himself for? Yes. Okay, now isn't it uh, rather snobbish for individuals to try to say that the bride is only the church? It's not just snobbish, but it just doesn't fit uh, with the Scripture. Now, for us, what dispensation, what of God offering out Himself for them, uh, what dispensation of the bride involves us in our part in being the bride of Jesus Christ? What? Grace. Yeah, the grace. Well, grace, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, this is the period of the age of grace, but grace is not new to the church. You know, grace did exist before the church. So I, I, I try to be careful and qualify that when we say grace, but I would say certainly the church. Uh, Jesus Christ established His church he for sure, for certain, told his disciples, his apostles, not just the disciples, specifically he told his apostles that he was going to build his church and that he was going to be built on himself. And we know that the way he built it on himself is through sacrificing himself. Uh, and that the apostles, we know from the scripture, were the foundational gifts to the church. And so those things, I think, uh, need... Little clarification. It's important for us, though, just to just to make some simple statements. Okay, so now, then, what's the purpose of the bride? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And here's the purpose. The first purpose is sanctification. The second purpose, uh, presented to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So the bride here is called the church in Ephesians chapter 5. And he says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined into his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And verse 32 is where I wanted to get to. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, I wish that the, I could wish today that I had time to preach a message in Ephesians chapter 5 about submitting ourselves one to another because submission does help us to understand Christ's purpose with his bride. And biblical submission is something that every believer needs to not only understand, but really opens an avenue of comprehension. You know, it is not merely a trite statement that obedience leads to understanding. Have you ever not understood something until you did it? There's just There are some things that you just can't know until you do, until you obey. You know, faith is an important one, isn't it? Has anyone ever realized anything great from God before faith? It's a good illustration of that, isn't it? Uh, exercise. Now, intellectually, you can understand the benefits of exercise, but until you do it, it really doesn't mean much. You don't really understand it, do you? Uh, there are a lot of things in life that you can say that once you do them, then you understand obedience is one of those things. You know, as a believer, if you think that you have to comprehend everything about the mind of God before you can submit to His will, my friend, you need to submit to His will, and then you'll comprehend things. Understanding comes after submission. And so that would be an important message. We don't have time to preach today, so just take that nugget and meditate on it. You're free to go back there if you'd like to and study that for yourself. Can you go back to Revelation chapter 21? In Revelation 21, we see the bride described as what? It's a trick question. It's not a trick question. What? I said Revelation 21, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, you're supposed to be in Revelation 21, but in Ephesians 5, we see the bride described as what? Church. The church. In Revelation 21, it's described as what? City. The new city. Does that mean that we're talking about something different in each instance? No, both of these descriptions are that this is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that, that make sense? Okay, so we see that uh, we, we've actually, we're going to get more information from Revelation chapter 9. 
And one of the things that we know about the bride of Jesus Christ is that she's a mystery. Paul said, I speak to you, this is a mystery, but I'm telling you about Christ and the church. And here John is given the revelation, which is a mystery revealed. And so there are things that we can glean from this, from this portion of the Scripture. And the most important thing, I believe, will be for us to take some application. I want to just look at the description of the New Jerusalem because of the reality that I have not seen nor you heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which the Lord has. But the things that God's promised for those that love Him. The reality of it is, is that we really are very, very limited in our comprehension of what it's going to be like to finally be forever with the Lord. And this is really the only place in the Scripture where we're given a description of what it's like. Uh, look, at, look at this. I don't know why this keeps coming up, but we'll look at the diamond here in verse 11. This is not a ring. This is, this is a, uh, uh, a light or a, a, a city. And the Bible says, having the, verse 11, the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. By the way, Charlie, you need to learn uh, the, uh, the different ratings for diamonds. You need to learn about what is it, cut and clarity and what are the other things? Cut, clarity, and something else. But anyway, this is a diamond. This is a city that's like a monster diamond. By the way, if you haven't given Charlie a hard time yet this year, it's already January the 6th. And so you're a little bit late, but it's not too late. Okay. Uh, verse 12. I had a wall, the city. So the city is literally, it has a light which is like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Um, you artistic types could perhaps draw this with, you know, lines that show, you know, light but clear as crystal. I, I can, I can, I have it in my mind's eye, but I can't create it and I can't really describe it. Uh, in, it's, it's described the best here. Verse 12 is the wall. It had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. By the way, this would be a good one. If somebody wants to talk about the wall with you and you don't want to talk about it, just talk about this wall with them. And say, yeah, you know, I wonder where we're going to put the uh, names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. You know, I wonder how that's going to be arranged. You just talk about the one you want to talk about. Three, it's going to have three gates on each of the four uh, squares. It's a four square. And, and so this is a description of heaven. Verse 12, uh, had the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 13, on the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. And the Bible says in verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So there are 12 foundations, and in the foundations, buried in the foundations, were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now this is not an insignificant reference here in the Scripture. Other places in the Scripture, for instance, Ephesians talks about the foundation of the church, which is what? The apostles and the prophets. And here we find the apostles' names are in the foundation of this great city. Now, you think that it's because each of the apostles were so special that their names became significant to God's eternal city? Or is there a little more something to it than that? In other words, I'm a Peter fan. I love Peter. I especially love the heart of Peter in 2 Peter. The best thing about Peter is that little gaze you get into kind of that mature, godly man that was being greatly used to the Lord with just such a sweet spirit about him as you read Second Peter. It really is a, a neat thing. But I just don't see Peter being foundational to the great city. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not bashing. I'm not picking here. You know, Paul, when he described himself, described himself as the chief of sinners. And I feel like the chief of sinners. I feel like the chief of sinners. But when I read Paul's rap sheet, I realize I have nothing on the man. I mean, just haven't just murdered a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the man was a terror against God. I mean, before Paul was born again, he breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And when God met Paul on the road to Damascus, he said, Why persecutest thou me? I've always been afraid to blaspheme the name of God. I've always been afraid to persecute the cause of Christ. I, I'll just be honest with you, I've had a healthy respect and fear the way we've lost it in this generation. It's an excerpt, it's an aside. 
but we've lost fear. Uh, fear to blaspheme. You know, as I read in the Scripture, and I, I, I was thinking of this last week as I was reading about the children of Israel complaining against God and Moses, I thought, how could anyone have the audacity to complain against God? I was taught growing up not to complain. I, I just My parents taught me it's not okay to complain about anything. You don't complain about anything. You sure don't complain about the bread that God's provided or the meat that He's provided and the water that He's provided from heaven. You don't complain about anything God's provided. I just never... I've, it was never okay. And, I, and I'm, I'm mentioning this to you because I think that it's a, it's a teaching, it's a, it's a mindset that we need to bring back into Christianity where people think it's okay to just gripe and be ungrateful for things and to complain about things, but ultimately complaining is blasphemy against God. In other words, God, the life you've given me, the circumstances that I am in, that you have provided, are not good enough, and therefore you are not good. It's incredible that individuals would have the audacity to blaspheme or complain against God. And we ought to be careful about <laughs> Christian. And just, just in general, complaining ought to be something that we just work out of our permissions. We just shouldn't have permission to. But I've had people say things like this to me. I've had people say, my life is hell. I've had people say that. I just think that's just utter blasphemy. I wouldn't dare say something like that. I wouldn't dare say something like that because of the accusation it makes against God. Now listen, Jesus gave Himself for you. And because of sin, you're wicked and you deserve consequences, but your life is in hell. Hell is something different altogether, not to be compared with anything that God's provided for you. And it's important for us. And, and so now, uh, let's, let's get back into looking at, we were talking about Paul and his name being the foundation. My point in discussing Paul along those ways uh, was to say, I don't think that Paul as a person merited his name in the, in the foundation. <laughs> Now, you could go off here, couldn't you? How many of you guys are going off saying, well, there are more than 12 apostles? And, uh, you know, deciding which ones get to have their names here. I don't know, and you don't either. It's fun to think about, but don't spend too much time there because you can't know until you see it, the 12 which make it in the foundation of the city. But if you want to discuss all the apostles, that's a fun, uh, probably fruitless argument, but fun nonetheless. Maybe it's Matthias that's there. Who knows? Uh, or it's certainly not Judas. I don't think Judas will be uh, one of the 12 here. That's scary, Judas, I mean to say. Now, so what's the significance? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. This city is a foundation that's built upon the living Word of God, the literal Word of God. And uh, my friend, <clears throat> till you begin to study the significance of God's eternal Word, you just won't understand the significance of this book, but literally the foundation of the city. The foundation of the city is... is the twelve apostles, and the scripture refers to the apostles as the, the apostles and prophets, that is the word of God. Those, that's the foundation of the church, and it's the foundation of the city, and we know uh, that Jesus Christ is the incarnate word, and so I believe the re reflection here would be the reflection of, uh, of Christ's church and of what Christ did through the apostles and ultimately what the apostles signify. Verse 14, now verse 15, He that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. No cheaping out for measuring instruments here. Uh, I posted on Facebook a, a few weeks ago a picture of one of my toolboxes. I was trying to clean some things out of my garage. And I think I found something like uh, eight or nine of the same tape measures. I have about, uh, I don't know how many tape measures, the 25-foot Stanley Fat Axis. I have a lot of them, and I have a toolbox with, I think, like seven of them in the drawer there. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I just, that has nothing to do with anything other than some of y'all woke back up and thought, man, you might have as many tape measures as I do. But <laughs> the reality of it is, is that this city is measured with a golden reed. And I don't want to go into the measurements here, but people that think that they understand the dimensions better than I do think that this city is four square and it is 1,500. Uh, 1,500 miles in every direction. So 1,500 miles up, left, right. So it's a, it's described as a cube, and it's described as a 1,500 mile wide city. Now, uh, let's look at verse 17. He measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man. 
that is, of the angel. That's the angel that measured 144 cubits that men would understand. In verse 18, the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold, like unto clear glass. Can you imagine a diamond wall with clear glass? You know that would cost more than $5.3 billion, I am pretty sure. <laughs> so, they need to definitely GoFundMe is not going to work on this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, and the seventh chrysolite. So initially when I read about the foundation of, of the twelve of the apostles, I think of it in terms of, you know, this one gets this section and this section, but it, see it's layered foundation, twelve layers of the foundation. And uh, so the 12th, uh, the 11th Jacinth, and the 12th, and Amethyst. And so if you want to have some more fun, try to figure out which stone was each apostle. And uh, they, you'd have <laughs> some, some more information. There's, there's a lot here uh, that's fun to just think about, and I think it's a fun thing, an appropriate thing to think about, is that great city, Jerusalem. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Okay, we've talked about a lot here, but now we get to some things that are significant to have some application which we can take home for today. Verse 22, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Now here we see a contrast between the new city, Jerusalem, which is the city where God is, and the earth. And I want to remind you believers, and at least this, this resonates with me quite a lot, that we will not be spending all of eternity floating around in clouds with funny little wings looking like babies playing harps. Uh, I just, I don't want, <laughs> I just, I, I hate the pictures that people paint or describe heaven by. Heaven's a real place. And it's a place that people with the kind of good passions that a believer can have when they're redeemed would be able to enjoy. I'm not into diamonds and emeralds and pearls and these sort of things. I'm more into going fishing or hunting, probably. Uh, than the description of heaven, although I certainly will be different uh, when I am in my glorified body. We're going to live on a new heaven and a new earth. And you say, Pastor, what's the new earth going to be like? Well, I suppose it would be similar to this earth minus the curse. I'm certain that God will not create a new earth which is inferior to the first. And by the way, how many of you do enjoy the world that God made? Anybody here enjoy the world God's... God made a beautiful world, didn't He? This sin-cursed world is gorgeous. I have never been in any place that did not have beauty in it that reflected the creation and the creative hand of God. Have you? You know, I just, I just love, I've just been so many beautiful places. I love living in South Florida. I think it's amazing that we're here this morning and we're thinking that winter is still here because it got down to 56 degrees last <laughs> night. I, I love a place like this, but you know it's pretty where it snows too. I don't live here simply because of the beautiful weather. I live here because I'm called here, but God could call me anywhere and I'd find beauty in it because it's the kind of world God created. It's pretty incredible. You think God will create something inferior to that when He makes a new earth? It'll certainly be superior in every sense, won't it? And then on top of that, you're going to have this city, Jerusalem. Literally, heaven's just built four square, 1,500 square miles is coming up out of the earth, and we're going to have free access. We know that Jesus said when he told his disciples he was going away that he was in his Father's house and he was preparing mansions there for us. And so this will sort of be like, I'm not trying to be silly or facetious, I'm being, I'm being serious with you. It will sort of be like the resort place we go to enjoy. We're going to be part of Christ's kingdom. We'll be carrying out actual kingdom functions. 
we will be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be uh, doing things without the curse of sin, probably very, very similar to what should have been done by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I think if you were to take a description, as much description of, as there is in the Garden of Eden and man's function and responsibility there, and you remove the sin curse, and you add the access to God, it's going to be very, very similar to what Adam had when he walked with God in the cool of the day. Or we'll be able to live on earth and we'll be able to have mansions in heaven and a place in this new city, Jerusalem, where we have access to God. And verse, uh, I wanted to, to point out as well, verse 25, the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Let me ask you a question. If the gates are always open, what's the point of the wall? Exactly. <laughs> Aren't you glad for the political times in which we live that actually, I've never asked this question before. I've just read it. But if the gates are always open, what's the point of the wall? Keep what? Keep out the dogs. Well, walls have always been to keep things out, haven't they? Mm -hmm. And I think that the wall here is... Uh, it is actual, but it symbolizes. In other words, this is not a symbolic wall. This is an actual wall, an actual barrier in heaven. Here we are talking about the wall. All right? This is an actual wall. It's not a symbolic wall. It is an actual wall, and it's an actual barrier. And I believe that for eternity we will be reminded of the straight and narrow way, the straight gate. In other words, in Matthew chapter 7, let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7 briefly, uh, shall we? I, think it's, I believe it's Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus is talking to his disciples and giving them uh, the... Um, requirements for a disciple. Let's see if I can find it here. In verse 13. One of the things that Jesus wants to be an attitude of a disciple is enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it let's read that last phrase again and few there be that find it now I'm reminded by Matthew chapter 7 and verse uh, 14 that as far as I know more people go to hell than heaven because the gate to destruction is wide and a lot of people go in it and the gate to eternal life is narrow and a few people go in it I just want to tell you without any kind of apology that God is narrow-minded when it comes to being part of this city, New Jerusalem. All roads do not lead to Rome, or in this case, to heaven. Many individuals want to overlook the statement that Jesus made in John 14, 6, when He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. My friend, I don't know how many people in my short lifetime have said to me, you know, I have a real problem with God requiring us to come to Him His way. How could God be good and require us to come to Him? Why can't I just do good works? Well, good works don't save you from your sin. They don't redeem you to, to God. Why can't I just come to God without Jesus? Why does it have to be Jesus? Why can't it be another religion? Why, 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 why? See, there are many paths to destruction, my friend, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one else has died. No one else is, uh, no one else is a worthy lamb to be sacrificed for our sin than Jesus. And I believe that the gates to this city with walls, I believe that the reminder to us by the walls are that there was a barrier between man and God. And that the open gates are a picture that there was a narrow way that provided us access to God. And the gates here are all about access. The wall is all about a barrier and the gates are all about access. And it's interesting that in this description that this is sort of the last thing described, isn't it? 
the gates. And they're, uh, it's never dark out, so you don't close them at night. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And again, we see supported what we said a moment ago about walls and gates. The walls keeping out evil things and gates allowing access the right way. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. And here we see encapsulated this great description of the gate. And it brings us right to our conclusion for this morning's message, doesn't it? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Several places in Revelation and in, throughout Scripture we, we see the Lamb's book of life. I do believe uh, that your name gets blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. And there's a beautiful picture there that God created man to be redeemed. In other words, a person how does a person get their name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life? Sin. Well, if it were sin, I wouldn't be in it. Only sinners get their names blotted out, taken out. Well, then everybody would be out. Changing the book of Revelation. Okay, so a person who adds or takes away from the words uh, could. And what would a person who rejects the Word of God, what would they be? I, I guess, yeah, you ultimately, you know. What would you say, Mike? An unbeliever. An unbeliever. Somebody that says, I don't believe. My friend, no one who is an unbeliever is redeemed. No one is, no one is separated from these abominations and defiling things without the blood of Jesus Christ. So the people that come in the gate are going to be people that come in because of the blood of Jesus Christ covering and cleansing their sins. And the people that are kept without and ultimately are denied access to God's new heaven, new earth, and new earth in the lake of fire that we saw described last week are individuals that have rejected the Son of God and had their names blotted out. My friend, if you're here this morning, can I say to you on behalf of God that His attitude towards you is He wants you to have access? God's provided for you. He said, I want you to have access. But it'll be access God's way. You're not going to be able to have your sin and have God. You're not going to be able to have it your way and God will compromise and allow it. This is a straight gate. It's a narrow way. And the only access, my friend, is the easiest access in the world, but it's the only access. It's a narrow way. It's not a broad way. It's not everything can go this way. No, only one thing goes this way, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Pastor, how do I have that? Well, my friend, nothing could be simpler, actually. Entering in at the straight gate is one of the simplest things that any individual can do, and that's to go in God's way. And the way God has provided, if you read John 3 and the description that Jesus gave Nicodemus was the way God provided was by faith in Jesus Christ. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And just like those bitten by venomous, deadly serpents in the wilderness could look to that serpent in the middle of the camp, that brass snake, which symbolized faith, they just turned and looked. You can look to Jesus. So, Pastor, I don't know if I have enough faith. Can you, can, can you ask God to save you? How much, how much did it take for a person to look to the serpent in the middle of in the, in the wilderness? How much faith did it take? Could you look at it in doubt? I think you could. I think you could say, you know what? I don't want to die. I want to be healed. And you could look. It doesn't mean you had perfect faith. Has any person ever come to God with perfect faith? Has anyone ever had perfect faith? No, you know what God wants from you? He wants you to look. He wants you to say, God, I want Jesus. I'm not looking at anything else. I'm not trying anything else, God. I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross. Spare Him rose again. I want the gift of eternal life. And you know, asking God for the gift of eternal life, my friend, is looking. It's looking. 
God, I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. You say, Pastor, that's a major step for me. Well, it's a straight gate. It's a straight way. So you're not going to be able to say, you know, I'll add that to my religions. One time I preached in a country with a lot of Hindus. One of the things you had to be careful about with Hindus was they were always glad to add another idol. They were always glad to add another religion. You had to make sure that they understood it's not Jesus and, it's only Jesus. You need to turn from your idols and turn to Jesus. And that was a big deal. That was a, that was a narrow way for the Hindus. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to try to do good works. And you know, I'll pray a prayer. And the Bible doesn't say pray a prayer. The Bible says look to Jesus. And when you look to Jesus, you turn from whatever you're looking to. It's the easiest thing and it's the most difficult thing. But it's the only way. And God's provided access to whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. That could be you. You're here this morning. You don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friends. It's a straight gate, but it's one you can go in and the doors are wide open. Amen. And God wants you to come. God, we thank You so much for this city of Jerusalem which illustrates so many things, so many truths. It's Your bride. We thank You so much for the instruction that's in it, but ultimately, God, we thank You for Jesus who was offered on the cross, freely laid down His life, and was freely offered for sinners to be redeemed. God, I pray if there's any individual that's here this morning that has not yet entered in at that gate, God, I pray that You would show them the simplicity of salvation. Help them understand that the path of destruction is broad. A lot of people are on it, but they're all going the wrong way. And we need to go the path that ultimately leads us through this gate into this eternal city where we have access to God and there's no need for a temple because Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Before we finish our prayer this morning, we've given thanks to God, but I'd like to ask every person to keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed. I want to ask a couple of questions. I'll have my eyes open, and I want to just ask a couple of questions just to make sure that every person here uh, is able to respond to the message. The reason to keep your eyes closed would be that I want you to have privacy, and I want everyone else to have the same. And so it wouldn't be right for you to open your eyes and look on someone else in their private moment. Uh, and the same would be for you, true for them to you. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor Price, I know the day, I know the time that I entered in. I entered that gate, the, not, not the New Jerusalem, but I went through the narrow way, which is Jesus Christ, the way to salvation. And I know when that was, and... Uh, I certainly don't think that I'm perfect or I've done everything right, but I know that I've been born again. And I understand what that means from my own experience. That's you here this morning. Just slip your hand up. Just, just let me know that. I know that I've entered the gate. Yeah, just slip it right back down. You here this morning, you'd say, well, Pastor Christ, you know, uh, I know I haven't gone in the straight gate. I've had issues with God and, and His way. But I can see from the way it's going to ultimately be, that there's not an alternative. And the Holy Spirit of God has shown me, He's convicted me today, that I need, I need Jesus as my Savior, and, and uh, God's working on me with, working with me about that, working on me about that. Don't call me out, don't embarrass me, but uh, pray for me, because God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life. Would you just slip your hand up if that's you here this morning? God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life, and uh, I know it. Just slip your hand up. Or one other question. You're a believer and you're here. And the way you viewed God, the way you view things sometimes is oftentimes more about what we have to do than it is about access. As you look at this portion, this passage of Scripture, you see your future, you'd have to say to yourself, you know something, I, my focus is off. I'm not living for Jesus in light of eternity. Now that could, that could be in a lot of different ways, but God's shown me specifically that my focus is not on the New Jerusalem. My focus isn't on where I'm going to be someday. My focus is on the things of this world. And I'm more about barriers than access because of the way that I viewed God or the way that I've been living. If God's just convicted you about something specific. You just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. Yeah, just slip them right back down. Pray for me. I've been viewing God that way. Yeah, anyone else? Just slip your hand right up, right back down. Okay, and right, we're going to have a moment of invitation then. We're going to allow people the time to respond as well. Uh, we've had uh, some mention that they would like to join uh, with us, and so if you'd like to make your way forward during the invitation, if you're physically able to do that, uh, 
and then we'll begin our invitation portion of our scripture. I want to ask everybody, uh, we'll conclude our prayer, and then I'll ask everybody to stand. Father, thank you so much for what you've shown us today, and we ask that you bless and move in our invitation now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please take your blue hymn books and stand to your feet? If God's uh, spoken to you, uh, rather than standing, you may want to just remain seated and do business with the Lord as we sing God's final call. You're here and you need to pray with someone? If, if you want to, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you need to pray with someone, feel free to move during the invitation. God's final call, page 250. Someday you'll hear